want to welcome you again today to our fourth part of our small group Bible studies on We Really Do Need Each Other campaign, or 40 Days of Community. I'm hoping that you are enjoying and being blessed by these small groups, by your devotionals, by the sermons that we've been posting online, or if you've been able to worship with us, that is just fantastic. Today, you were asked a lesson as you came in by your small group leader about who you would be willing to die for. And here's the question I have to ask. Does Jesus really expect us to die for other people? Especially people we don't know, and maybe even people you don't like. Oh, here's a confession for you. I've had thousands of people I've known as their pastor over the last 25 years, and I will tell you, I don't really like all of them. It's true. There's some of them that drive me absolutely crazy. And you know what? I bet you I drive them crazy too. I used to serve at a very well-to-do congregation, and there was a member of this congregation, very wealthy. She was one of the wealthier of the wealthy. Millions of dollars in the bank. Doing quite well. Well healed, you would say. And she came up to me one time when we were studying a lesson on, on giving to the poor. And you might remember uh, the lessons about, uh, that Jesus spoke about how we're to give and, and so forth. And, and she said, you know, I, I really don't have to be, I don't have to give away all my wealth to the poor. I just have to be willing to give up, wink, wink, my wealth to the poor. How good is that? Also, we went on to talk about giving our lives for other people. She says, you know, the Bible doesn't really ask me to, to die for other people. I mean, I, I have to be willing to die, but I don't have to really die for other people. And I'm willing to do both, so that makes me a pat, pat, pat on the back, a really good person, right? Really? Isn't that nice that this person's resolve will never be tested, challenged, or tried? Anyone can say whatever they want to to justify themselves and make themselves look before God. But if you're not tested about your willingness to give to the poor or to give your life, chances are you really are not willing to give your life and give up your wealth to the poor. Here's the truth. If you were to ask me, am I willing to give my life up for others? There's only two people that I would in a heartbeat, in a moment, without a thought, give my life up for, and that's my wife and my daughter. If I had the ability to exchange it for theirs any day, every day of the week, I would give up my life for them. And I know I would. But the rest of y'all, sorry, you're on your own. You know what? As one of our members said to me one time, if a bus came and we're going to hit you and I might be able to save you by pushing you out of the way of the bus, but I might risk getting myself killed too, I'd, I'd scream when you got hit by the bus, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I'd feel sad. I'd cry and I'd feel guilty about it. I really would. I'd feel guilty about it, but I'm sorry. You're on your own. I'm not going to give my life for you. I got other things to live for. Does that make me a bad person? Do I have to give my life for you? Let me read to you from our lesson for today from 1 John 3.16. John writes, We know that real love, what real love is, because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Huh. Didn't he just tell us right there, I have to be willing to die for you? But my question for you is, is that really what John is saying? The phrase that's that lived literally translated, not in the translation I used, I'm using a new living translation, but in other translations it says to lay down your life for others. Jesus laid his life down for us, we need to lay it down for others. And we know that Jesus laid his life down for us by dying for us, but Jesus' death is the only salvific death on the planet. His is the only death that brings salvation, the only death that really matters to you and me. My death won't do anybody any good, okay? And so, I don't think that's what John means. In fact, a more accurate translation of this and a real sense of this word is that we ought to be willing to invest our lives in each other. Yes, Jesus invested his lives in us by 
dying for us. But you are called to invest your lives in each other, but that doesn't mean that you have to die to do it. In fact, what good are you dead? You are called to invest yourself in the lives of others. Doesn't that change how you see this verse? God's not asking you to die for others. God is asking you to live for others and invest yourselves in their lives. Reuben Welsh, in his book, We Really Do Need Each Other, says the following, It's no special blessing to come to the end of our lives with love unshared, selves ungiven, activities inactivated, deeds undone, emotions unextended. Isn't it God's intention that when we come to the end of our lives, we're just about used up? See, what God's intention for us, Reuben is saying to us, is to invest ourselves and the lives of others that God has given us, those around you. And so if you're halfway through with your life, are you about halfway used up? Have you given half of yourself away yet? John is calling us to invest our lives in the lives of others because that's how we love God. It is impossible to do in a cloistered room by yourself somewhere, and it is impossible to do if we keep throwing stumbling blocks in the way of our loving other people. Do you know how we prevent ourselves from loving other people? Let me tell you the stomach block that you and I throw in front of each other that keeps us from loving other people and investing ourselves in the lives of other people. The stumbling block we put in front of each other is we categorize people. Oh, I told you we're not talking politics, but politicians are really good at this. Talk show hosts are really good at this. Radio talk show hosts are good at this. Yeah, DJs are good at this. We thingize people. We categorize them. Oh, they're Muslims. Oh, they're Republicans. Oh, those dang Democrats. Oh, those women. Oh, those Gen Ys. Oh, those Mexicans. Oh, those dang police officers. Oh, those sexist pigs. Oh, those black people. Oh, those white people. Do you see how we, what we do with them? Is we make yous instead of uses. We put yous over there in your category where I thingize you. I make an object out of you. And therefore, by putting you in a category, I dismiss you and I don't have to therefore love you. I'm no longer obligated to love yous. I'm not, I'm not obligated to love you, your category of people. Where does it say that in the Bible? Where does it say that we can categorize and thingize people like this? Now, I know you're thinking, well, I don't hate Muslims. I don't hate these people. It's those dang Republicans that do. It's those dang Democrats that do. It's those dang white people. It's those dang black people. <laughs> you just thing eyes people, didn't you? I'm going to tell you how you do it every single day and how we do it. Have you ever posted on Facebook, on one of your pages, the following post? I see stupid people everywhere. Ha <laughs> ha! Isn't that funny? Oh, that's so funny. You get 100 likes from that. You just thingized people. Is that really of God? To thingize people? Oh, stupid people everywhere, except for me, of course, because I'm not one of them. Did you ever stop to think that you are the stupid people for somebody else? Somebody's thingizing you? How does that feel? Really good, huh? We say sarcastic, nasty comments about others that we dismiss. So maybe you're not a bigot. Maybe you don't have a problem with Mexicans or black people or white people. Maybe you don't have a problem with Republicans or Democrats. Maybe you're not one of those people that thing eyes as them. But maybe you're one of those that thing eyes as people because you dismiss them as stupid and unworthy of your care and concern. You dismiss them. You thing eyes them. Remember, you are somebody else's foolish joke. You are somebody else's stupid person. Somebody else has thingized you. Somebody else has dismissed you. This has no business in the kingdom of heaven. I don't ever want to see on the Facebook pages of any of those folks here at our church, I see stupid people. That is no business on your page. Because that's not how we're called to love each other. Those people you dismiss as stupid are the people that God has put in your life 
to love. And you may not understand them. They may frustrate you. But instead of being frustrated with them and dismissing them, maybe what you need to do is find a way to love them and understand them. If we are really, truly to love people, to invest ourselves in the lives of others, we need to stop categorizing them, stop dismissing them, and start loving them as God has loved us. We need to see those around us as people to be loved, not as a category, not as a thing, not as an object to be dismissed. I want to tell you a story of how God has transformed my way of thinking. See, I grew up in a very conservative Christian congregation. I'm here to tell you I am still a conservative Christian in my faith and my walk with God. But I also will confess that I have had to have my life transformed by God. In many conservative congregations, let me tell you how this happens, we have often dismissed thingized, categorized, are you ready for this? Gay people. Ooh, yes, I said that word, gay people. How do we treat gay people in conservative Christian congregations? We put bubble wrap, if they do come into our church, I don't know why they would want to, but when they do come into our churches, we put bubble wrap around them and we stick them up in a dark corner of the church and put duct tape on them and say, you can't come out of that corner until you repent and become like us. But you know what us are? We're a bunch of hypocrites. The us is filled with all sorts of sin and all sorts of shameful activities and behaviors that we dismiss in ourselves. What am I talking about? We've got gossip mongers. Oh, we've got, oh, we, we say it, of course, like we're praying for people, don't we? Oh, did you see Jimmy? Oh, he and Milena, Milena are fighting. Oh, you should hear about, we need to pray for Jimmy because his attitude needs to be changed. That's called gossip but we do it under the guise of prayer. We're gossip mongers. We're always talking about each other and the other person in the church that we don't like and this and that. And you know that gossip is the most destructive sin in the community of Christ? But we're not putting bubble wrap around gossip mongers and we're not sticking them in a dark corner and duct taping them there. We participate in it. Every single person in the church. Oh, let me tell you another one. Here's another good one. How many fat people are in our church? Oh, yes, I said the word F-A-T, fat. Sorry, but a lot of us are fat. And you know that gluttony, being fat, is a sin before God because we are destroying the temple of Christ. You are living in the sin of your fatness every single day when you pick up another crispy cream donut and stuff it in your mouth. Oh, I know, I'm just big boned. Oh, I just have some type of biological problem that causes me to be fat. Really? And then you sit there and eat a bag of Doritos and corn chips and four slices of pizza, and you're going to tell me it's your metabolism? I don't think so. Most people, not all people, I do understand that there's some people who are overweight because they have a biological problem, but 99% of the people are fat because they overeat and don't get enough exercise, and you are living in sin an unrepentant sin of your obesity, we should bubble wrap you and stick you in the dark corner of the church somewhere until you repent of your obesity, right? But we don't treat you that way. We just love you. How many fat pastors are sitting up there condemning gay people in the pulpits? Meanwhile, they stand on the same condemnation that they think is a condemnation for gay people. What type of people are we? We can be monsters in the church because we thing eyes people, gay people. Ooh, I'm going to tell you how God changed me and slapped me in the face about gay people and how my attitude needed to be changed and how I needed to repent. Two couples, two couples came to me, gay couples lesbian couples, within two weeks of each other, unrelated to each other, by the way. They didn't know each other. But they both called me up, and I had a very similar conversation to one. But one a woman named Jacqueline. She is, uh, unfortunately, Jacqueline has since died of cancer, but we were there for her and her, her partner and their time of need. 
but she had cancer and, and she was looking for a church. She called me up and she was from France and she had this, this wonderful French accent and, and, uh, and it was really shocking when she called me because I wasn't expecting to talk to a woman speaking in a, in a French accent, but she called me just out of the blue one day and she said, you know, is this Pastor Dave? I said, yes. And she said, well, I just wanted to talk to you. Do you think, do you think your church would welcome a lesbian couple in worship? And I, and I thought, well, sure. I think most co congregations would say they welcome people, whoever they are. And I said, sure, you'd be welcome. And she said, well, congratulations. You said the same thing 100% of the congregations we've approached say about us. You're welcome in our church. But she said, let me tell you what I find. 50% or more of the congregations I go to, the conservative congregations I go to, they put us in the back pew, in the back corner, where we cannot interact with anybody until we repent and become like everybody else. And then the other 50% of the congregations we go into, the liberal churches, all they want to talk about is the next political march on Washington, how we're going to change the laws of the country to do what we want to be done. She said, I just feel like I'm an object that's supposed to be there for their next march. She said, all I want to do is come to a church where I can hear about Jesus. Can you do that? <laughs> wow. Are your toes being stepped on right now? Isn't that what we all need? just to hear about Jesus and to be in the presence of a community of Christians who love us, whatever our condition in life might be. Can you do that, Pastor? Those words transform my way of thinking about gay people. They're not others. They're not things. They're not objects. They're not people that we need to keep at arm's length. They're not going to infect our congregation in some way. They're not a disease. They're not a voting block for the next political election. They're people like you and me who just want to be loved and know that Jesus loves them. Wow. Does that transform your way of thinking? I hope so. Because if you want to love, if you want to really love people, we need to stop putting stumbling blocks in the way of that prevent us from loving people. We need to stop categorizing them. We need to stop, we need to stop putting them in boxes. We need to stop making things of them. We need to stop making them a them or a use and start making them an us. Gay people are us. Mexicans are us. Muslims are us. Fat people are us. Insecure people are us. Whites are us. Blacks are us. There is no room in the kingdom of heaven for division because in the kingdom of heaven God doesn't thing eyes us. God comes to us all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we look forward to the discussions that we are going to have in our lessons today with each other. I know for some, the word that I just spoke might be a bridge too far for them right now, and it might make them uncomfortable. That's okay. Sometimes we're challenged with the word of God and the radical nature of God's love for us and for humanity. We pray that you would help us to stop thingizing people and categorizing them and start loving people as you've embraced and loved us. For you do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have some powerful and wonderful conversation today. Maybe you will be able to talk about the times that you have been thingized and categorized and marginalized by others. I'm praying that you would overcome these categories and that we would just see each other as people to be loved. Amen.